no one will care for you like your parents will care for you. At Annur Education Center, we give orphans a loving home, clothing, food, and education. Be the orphan's parent by sponsoring an orphan for 18,000 Rand or 1,500 Rand per month. Annur Education Center, a place where orphans call home. Imagine, imagine a world where each person has access to their basic rights. A world where everyone is equal. Imagine a world where each person will have an equal share in each single seed of wheat. Where each child has the freedom to learn. This Ramadan, we ask you to feed the fasting in 14 countries around the world with AMA. Provide an iftar box for 100 rand, a hamper for 1,500 rand, or feed a village for 15,000 rand. Donate today at Africa Muslims Agency and imagine the difference you can make. Our three series on our journey towards Hajj. Last week we have discussed the shurut of the Hajj, meaning the requirements, what is required of a person before Hajj become followed upon you. And then we've also named the five arkan of the Hajj, or the, rather the six arkan of the Hajj. And we know that if any of the arkan of hajj are left out, then your hajj is invalid and it is incomplete. And I've introduced you to the first rukun of the hajj last week, which is the specific niyyah for hajj with ihram. So being in the state of ihram, after our discussion last week, I'm sure you will understand that ihram is basically the holiest state that a Muslim can go into. Because it shows the greatness of Umrah and it shows the greatness of Hajj. You cannot just go and perform it. You need to go into that state of ihram. And I've explained last week, how do we go in ihram? Just very quick recap. You go into the bathroom, you perform your istinja, etc., etc., and then you go into the shower, you wash your complete body from head to toe with soap and water. Then you rinse off all the soapiness from your body, and then it is sunnah to take a wudu, a complete wudu, not farud, it is sunnah, because if you take ghusl without taking wudu, then you are considered like a person who got wudu also. But it is good to take wudu, a sunnah, to take wudu, and then you stand in the cubicle with the tap, the water flowing over your head, front and back, over your right side, front and back, and of course under the armpits, and then on your left hand side, front and back, under your arms, and there your ghusl is complete. You take a ghusl like that either for sunnah purpose or for a compulsory purpose. If you need of a faral ghusl, you take exactly the same ghusl, the same procedure. The only difference is, is the niya. So if you need of a sunnah ghusl, of course, now wait a sunnah tal ghusl, I intend to make a sunnah ghusl. When you need a farud ghusl or a compulsory bath, then now wait a farud al ghusl, you take, make niya for a farud ghusl. Now, now that you know and understand what ihram is, hajj basically consists of only five days. And the first day of hajj falls on the eighth day of Dil Hijjah. We are now, we are now in the last few days of Shawwal. In about a week or two, the first hujjaj will be leaving. That is the month of Dil Qadah. And then the first 10 days and 13 days of the Hijjah, that is the 
days of Hajj. So we are already in the months of Hajj. This month of Shawwal ushers in the period of Hajj. And then Dhul Qadah and Dil Hajj. So whether people go for five weeks, six weeks, or whatever amount of days, Hajj is only five days or even six days, as I will explain. So now the first day of Hajj, which fall on the eighth day of the Hijjah, arrives. And there's great joy in Makkah amongst the Hujjaj, because everyone is now looking forward now to go into Ihram and to go to the places where Allah ordered us to go for Hajj and to perform the manasik and the ibadah of the Hajj. So on this morning, early morning, we go into ihram, our bath, everything. We put on our clothing for ihram and then we say our niyyah. And I took you step by step last week and I just want to mention again. If you take your complete ghusl, you are not in ihram yet. Then you make two raka'at salatul ihram. I mean you first put on your, on your ihram clothing for the men two pieces of white cloth. One is the lungi, which comes from above the navel till over the knee, and the other part is the rida that covers both your shoulders, that is for the man. Two pieces of seamless cloths, and you strip yourself naked, you've got nothing on underneath, you strip yourself naked in the presence of Allah. The woman's ihram is exactly as you are dressed, but also preferably white. Why? The Nabi encourages us to use the white clothing, because the whiteness of the clothing, and if you look at white clothing, it looks clean, it looks pure, so clean and pure must your heart now be, and your mind, because you are going to perform the greatest of ibadah, and that is the hajj. So now you've washed your whole body, you've taken your ghusl, you're not in ihram yet. You put on your ihram clothing, you're not in ihram yet. You perform two raka'at salatul ihram, you're not in ihram yet. So up to this point, if you still want to put on a little atar or a little scent or something, then it is permissible for you. But the moment you say your niya, Allahumma inni uridu al-hajj wa ahramtu bihi lillahi ta'ala fayassirhu li wa taqabbalhu minni You can say it in Arabic or you can say it in Afrikaans or English O oh Allah, I intend to perform hajj and I now go into ihram for hajj, O oh Allah O oh Allah, accept from me and make it easy for me The moment you say that niya now you're in haram. Now you can't use sweet-smelling oils. Men can't wear closed shoes. You must wear sandals, open sandals. The woman, she stays with that niya, she goes into haram, and you dress exactly as you are now. Even in haram for the lady, you cannot have anything touching the skin of your face. So better not to wear a veil at that time, for those who want to wear a veil, they must wear it so that it hangs a distance without touching the face, the, 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 the skin of the face. Now we're in ihram, and it is this first day of Hajj, and this day is called Yawmu Tarwiyah. Yawmu Tarwiyah means the day of watering. Why the day of watering? In the time of the Prophet ﷺ, more than 1400 years ago, they didn't have all the facilities ready on Mina <clears throat> that we have today. Today when you get to Mina, you have beautiful tents, you have special services, you have extra special services, and then you have royal services, and it's all money that talks. It's really a pity that this greatest ibadah of Hajj has been so much commercialized that the poor people find it so difficult to go for Hajj today. It's really a pity. May Allah remove those hearts, hard 
hardships and obstacles and may Allah grant ease and call all those people who have that burning desire and niyyah in their heart to go on this journey. May Allah call all of us. Amen. <clears throat> so now, they didn't have the facilities that we have today. So what did the Prophet do? He used to send people, some people, a team of people ahead to go and prepare for the arrival of the Hujaj and Mina. And they used to pre prepare the water for wudu, for drinking purpose and everything. That is why it's called Yawm Tarwiya, the day of watering. Mina is a massive plain. It is situated between years Makkah, then at a the distance there's the plains of Mina, and further on there's another plain which is called Musdalifa, and another plain which is called Arafa. Now it shows to you that Hajj does not only mean visiting the Kaaba. Hajj also is not to worship the Kaaba. Because now Allah orders you to turn your back, move away from Makkah, and go to the plains of Mina, which is more inside the middle of the desert, where there's really nothing. And later on we'll discover why Allah take us away from the grand holy city of Makkah. Allah say, don't stay here, go there in the desert where there's nothing. There's a reason for that which we will discuss later. But this place of Mina today has got a mighty lot of tents on it. All white tents and it all look the same. And you can get lost very quickly. That's why I urge the Hujaj always stay with your group. Don't wander off because you're going to look, where's my tent? And all the camps look the same. All the camps. And you look at everyone around you, everyone got white ihram on, so you can get lost very quick, just like that. So now we are ordered to go, which is a great sunnah, to go to, go to this plain of Mina. Now we will be at Mina, say, around about 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock the morning of that first day of Hajj. There's nothing for you to do that day except rest. And people, when you have that chance to rest, rest. Because you're going to need that rest. You're going to need energy. You're going to need strength for the remainder of your Hajj days. Because it's all about walking for many of us. It's all about walking or get into a bus and sometimes a bus can break down and they're not sending another bus and you are forced to walk a couple of kilometers which we are, many of us are not used to. That's why now already start your walking. Build up your energy level. Build up a little fitness level. Build up and bring yourself to a level where if the need arises for you to go and walk, then you can walk. So now you come to Mina. Everyone is assigned to their camps. They've got the South African camp, the Nigerian camp, all the African countries together, European countries, how they lay out the tents. You go to the camp that is assigned to you, and now your lessons start. Because despite Mina being a massive valley, you are given a space of a mattress size only. Everyone get a mattress. With your mattress you get your sheet, you get your blanket, you get your pillow, and your little overnight bag that you have with you stays also with you on that mattress. That is your size. The other mattresses next to you on both sides belong to other people. So the first lesson we learned here is when you come to Mina, the only space that you get is a mattress size space. And if you look at the size of a mattress, it's the size of a cover. 
كوبس يو نو كوبس كو بس كوبس قبر ان ذا جريفيارد If you go to the Kubas now, you'll find baby-sized graves, you'll find toddler size, you'll find children size, but the standard size in the, in the Kubas, in the graveyard, is a matter of size. So which means, Mina symbolizes for us that we have died now, we are in the Haram, we've got our kafan on, we are now in the Barzakh. Barzakh mean that place that you die, they put you in the grave, it, you are now in that dimension which is between this world that we are in and the day of judgment. That is Barzakh, the intermediary world. Mina is like the intermediary world where you are now waiting for the day of judgment which is tomorrow, which is Arafah. So there's nothing for you to do. You get a matter-sized space which symbolizes your cover and now you take stock of yourself. It is a day of stock-taking. There's a tradition that says, Hasibu qabla antu hasabu. Take stock of yourself before stock is taken off you. Take accountability of yourself before the day comes that accountability will be taken off you or from you. So Mina is a day of introspection. Mina is a day of stock taking that will look deep into yourself. And as a hujaj, as a haji, you ask yourself the question, why did Allah require me to travel so many miles to go into this situation of ihram the state of ihram that I'm in, bringing me here in the middle of the desert on this plain of Mina, why did Allah bring me here? It's a time of reflection. And the best way to reflect is to reflect on who are we? Who are you? Where do you come from? What are you doing here? Where are you going to? Where will you end up? Stock taking. And Sayyidina Ali radiallahu an, the, 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 the son-in-law and the nephew of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he puts it so beautiful when he says in a saying, Inna Allah ta'ala khalaq al-malaika وَرَكَّبَ فِيهِمُ الْعَقْلِ And I want us to listen to this. In order to understand yourself, who you are, and what you are. Listen to this beautiful advice. He say, when Almighty Allah created the farishtas, the angels, the malaika, رَكَّبَ فِيهِمُ الْعَقْلِ Allah imbued in the malaika, placed in the malaika, pure reason. So the malaika is that creation that Allah created from nur and it is impossible for a malaika to disobey Allah. There's not a single malaika that can disobey Allah. That also proved to us that shaitan was not a malaika. We don't believe in the theory of fallen angels that angels can sin. between right and wrong, but they can't choose. They don't have the power of choice. They only carry out the commandments of Allah. That is why we know shaitan was not the angel. He was not the malaika. Shaitan is a jinn. And a jinn is that creation that Allah created from fire. Like Allah created us from dust, Allah created the jinn from fire. Like we can obey Allah and disobey Allah, the jinn can also obey Allah and disobey Allah. They also, like us, have the power of choice. That's why Allah says, La amla anna jahannam min al jinnati wa nasi ajma'in. On the day of judgment, Allah says, I'm going to fill up the fire of jahannam with rebellious humans and rebellious jinn. So you have good people and bad people, and you have good jinn and bad jinn. 
You have Muslim people and non-Muslim people. You have Muslim jinn and non-Muslim jinn. There's many good Muslim jinn that also worship Allah. They also make salah. They also fast. They also sit in lectures like this and listen to what is being said. They are also present in the masjid. There's jinn sitting right here, right now. There's jinn sitting here and they are part of this lesson. Must I tell you where they're sitting? <laughs> I'll rather not. The man says, But there's jinn also present here. That's why I always tell people, respect the sacredness and the sanctity of the masjid because in the masjid there's always good always malaika making ibadah for Allah and there's also good jinn and other spiritual creation that we don't know of they are also making salah and ibadah for Allah and tasbih in the masjid that's why we must always respect the masjid and so Sayyidina Ali say Allah created the malaika and give them pure reason wa khalaq al baha'im and Allah created the animals, the beast of the earth, the wild animals. Allah created the animals and Allah placed inside the animals pure lust and desire. Animals just act themselves out based on their desire. Animals don't have that power to decide this is right and that is wrong if a female if a male dog sees a female dog he will just jump on her he won't care who sees him because the animal they've got no shame they've got no haya they've got no modesty and therefore animals will not be accountable by Allah for their actions because they are animals now comes the punch وَخَلَقَ بَنِي آدَمْ And then Allah created us, human beings, the children of Adam alayhi salam. Allah created the human being وَرَكَّبَ فِيهِمْ الْأَقْلْ وَالشَّهْوَةِ And Allah placed inside us the pure intellect and reason of the malaika and Allah also placed in us the lust and the desires of the animals. So we have the potential to live and to become greater than the malaika. This is what Sayyidina Ali say. He say, وَمَنْ غَلَبَ أَقْلُهُ عَلَى الشَّهْوَةِ فَهُوَ أَعْلَى مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ Whoever allows the angel qualities to rule in their life and they are good people then in the estimation of Allah they are higher than the malaika that is the power that Allah has given us that we can become in that stage where Allah will regard us as higher than the malaika وَمَنْ غَلَبَ شَهْوَتُهُ عَلَى الْأَقْلِ فَهُوَ أَدْنَى مِنَ الْبَهَائِمِ and whoever allows his lust and his desires, that animalistic qualities, to control him, he becomes lower than the lowest beast. Lower than the lowest animal such a human being can become. So we've got the potential to become higher than the malaika, or we can fall lower than the lowest beast and animal. This day on Mina, Contemplate on these words. Contemplate on these teachings. Allah has brought you on the pure path of Hajj. You are with the pure people who are called Hujaj. You are on the holy plain of Mina, where so many prophets of Allah are buried. So many prophets of Allah walked on the plains of Mina. In fact, when the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam made his one and only hajj, he said to the Sahaba, I can still see Nabi Musa alayhi salam walking on this plain of Arafah, on this plain of Mina, and he had a red jubah on. Within his prophetic hindsight and insight, 
Allah showed him how Nabi Musa walked through the valley of Mina. And there's so many prophets buried on Mina. There's a massive masjid on Mina, which is called Masjid al Khif. If you can visit the masjid, visit it. If not, halas, you can see it from a distance. That masjid is built on the very spot where the Prophet وسلم, pitched his tent when he spent the day on Mina. Masjid al Khif is still there. So now, whole day on Mina, you just indulge yourself in Quranic recitation. Now and then, if you remember, call out, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, Labbaik la sharika laka Labbaik, Inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk la sharika lak. Every time you say the Labbaik, the Malaika respond to you and say, Labbaik wa sa'adaik, MashaAllah, welcome, welcome, O Hujaj, Labbaik, welcome to you too. The Malaika respond to you. So say a lot Labbaik when he's in the state of Ihram, while they on Mina for that day. Read Quran, make tasbih. Now and then you can sit in groups of people where you discuss good things. Not fitna, not skinner stories, not bad things. Indulge in good talk. Keep your company and choose your company. If you choose the wrong company, it can spoil your hajj. Keep good company. So now, the time of Dhuwar comes in. You are Mina, you'll hear the Adhan loud and clear from Masjid al Khif. Masjid al Khif is a massive masjid. Loud and clear through the whole of Mina, you can hear the Adhan. You don't have to go to the masjid. Because the masjid is going to be full in any case. There's people who sleep and stay in the masjid for those days that they are there. So now what we do, wherever we are in the camp of Mina, we get our group together after the Mu'addin gives the Adhan, we get our group together and then we read our Dhuwar Salah in Jamaat. But listen carefully, we make Dhuwar Salah Two rakats. Two rakats, because this is what the Nabi did when he was on Hajj for that five days in Mina. He brought the Dhuwar Salah, which is usually four rakats, becomes two rakats. Then immediately after the, the Imam said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. The people who follow the Hanafi Madhab, they don't make two rak'ats. We usually let the person stand in front who follow the Shafi Madhab of two rak'ats. So when the Imam says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, then those who follow the Hanafi Madhab, they will stand up and build on the other two rak'ats. They make the full salah. We are not going to go into debate and quarrels, but. The Nabi said, Khudu anni manasikakum, take your hajj from me. Yes, we perform the two rak'ats as the Nabi did it, but the scholars of the Hanafi Madhab, they've got their reasons, their reason, but we are not on salatul qas, uh, salatul safar, the salah of traveling, we are stationed in Makkah. Allahu alam, it is their understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah. And we believe that all four madhabs, all right. Shafi is not better than Hanafi. Hanafi is not better than Maliki. Maliki is not better than Hanbali. All four madhabs are correct. So whichever school of thought a person follow, whichever madhab, you follow that teaching. Don't go and quarrel with people. Okay? Are you with me? So now, we sit, we wait for the people who are reading the extra two rak'ats, and the moment they finish, then we all bring the talbiyah together. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik, labbaik la sharika laka labbaik, inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk la sharika laka. We usually bring it three times, okay? 
Very good to announce your presence in the presence of Allah always. Now you rest and lunch will be served and people will be encouraged again to rest till Asr. Asr time comes in, once again you're going to hear the Adhan loud and clear. Again, like we did Dhuhr, we are going to make Asr in Jamaat two rakats. So all the Salahs like Dhuhr, Asr and Ishai, which normally consist of four rakats, become two rakats. So Asr, two rakats, and again, Imam say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, will bring the Talbiya, la baik, Allahumma la baik again. Then after Asr, which is usually a sacred period, we encourage people to do tasbih and dhikr, or even if they feel they want to stand outside the camp, maybe the husband wants to see the wife, or the wife wants to see the husband, they can quickly meet outside, just chat quickly, find out if your partner is okay, but no lovey-dovey talk. Because you're in a haram. You're in a haram. You find the guy, say, peep into the tents, show to their wife, go, I miss you. Come, I Whatever signs are waste of my car, you know. But you are now in a haram, you can't engage in lovey dovey talk. You can't tell my darling, I miss you, I wish you were with me in this tent. There's no couple tents. The ladies in one section, the men in one section. So, yes, you can do things, but please preserve and respect the state of a haram that you are in. And I always tell Hujaj, and please I'm saying it once again with the greatest of love and the greatest of respect to everyone. As a haji in ihram, a cigarette does not befit you. Throw that cigarette away. Or tone down now already. I can't fathom it. I can't, you know this, not nice feelings that go through me when I see people in the haram standing, laughing, choking, and blowing circles with the smoke. You must remember the Nabi say, if you want to chase the malaika of rahma away from you, then you must indulge in nonsensical things and do things which don't have a nice smell. Nicotine doesn't smell nice. You are chasing the malaika of rahma away from you. And I'm not saying it with condemnation, I'm saying it as a concerned brother with love and respect for everyone. Respect the state of haram that you are in, always. Now, Maghrib will come in. Again you will hear the Adhan loud and clear. Again we'll stand up, make ourselves, and we we'll make Maghrib. Remember I said, Salahs must be halved. So how many rakats are you going to perform for Maghrib? Not one and a half. I hear someone here say one and a half. You can't make one and a half rakats. Maghrib stays three rakats. Okay? Maghrib stays three rakats. So Dhuhr two, Asr two, Maghrib three, Ishai comes in two, tomorrow morning Fajr we still on Mina, we make how many rakats? Look at my fingers, how many rakats? Two! You can't half Fajr. Can't make Fajr one rakat. So Fajr stays two rakats as it normally is. Dhuhr two, Asr two, Maghrib three, Isha two. That is the only thing you do on Mina. Your Salah, as the Prophet taught us, and also deep concentration and focus on why Allah brought you there. Because that whole day, you are in a haram. 
And it's very important when in a haram, there will come the need for you to go to the toilet or to go to the bathroom. Make sure that when you go to the toilet, that nothing spills on your ihram clothing. No impurities spill on your ihram clothing. Make sure that you make your istinja properly. And make sure that when you come out of the toilet, what do we usually do? We wash our hands. Make sure that you wash your hands with water and non-scented soap. Like lux soap. No, is it not lux? Sunlight. Sorry, not lux soap. Sunlight soap. Sunlight soap, which is not a scented soap. And also nowadays you have that non-scented natural soaps, which is not scented. You can use that to wash your hands. You cannot wash your hands with lux soap and with scented soap. Otherwise, you spoil your ihram and you have to pay a dam. Okay, are you with me? So make sure that we see to that. Now we spend the whole night, the whole day on Mina. We spend the whole day on Mina. Now the Sunnah is, listen very carefully people, because I'm, you see, I'm trying to explain it to you that everyone, even the simplest person or even the child sitting here will understand. The Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, is to spend the whole day on Mina, sleep over, make Fajr Salah, and then after Fajr, leave to go to Arafah. That is the normal, that is the Sunnah. However, you're going to find that the Mu'assasa, who is the authority of the Hajj, and who regulates things for the, all the nations who are there, they will maybe say that, or make the request that the South Africans maybe leave Mina and go to Arafah, maybe two o'clock or three o'clock the morning, way before Fajr. It is permissible for you to go. And then you go, rather give your cooperation. Don't say, no, but I learned that you must stay here and you must make Fajr. They will just tell you, okay, fine, you can stay, you can make Fajr, but you find your own way to Arafah. Rather give your cooperation. Work with the Hajj authorities who give the instruction to your group that you are traveling with. So listen to your group leaders, give your cooperation that everything can go smooth and easy, inshallah. So normally we will get to Arafah after Fajr, but sometimes if the situation is so where we are told to go, then we'll reach Arafah before Fajr and make Fajr on Arafah. The only thing I must warn you of the very, very early hours before Fajr on Arafah, there's massive mosquitoes, really. And that mosquitoes, I think it's Christian mosquitoes. <laughs> because they can't care, they don't care. Whether you're in a haram, whether you're a haji, they bite you. And I can tell you now already, because someone is going to ask a question, but what do you do if a mosquito bites you and you're in a haram? People think they can't scratch. You bite back. <laughs> Hit him. Slatam sat. Because it's permissible for you. It's permissible. Don't overdo it with killing every mosquito you see somewhere you want to kill. Just those mosquitoes that come your direction, you are allowed to kill it. You are allowed to kill anything that is harmful or poisonous. If you're sitting on Mina and you see maybe a scorpion or a snake, you are allowed to kill it. Because otherwise it will bite you. Or maybe you sit, you see a haji sleeping there, and you see a scorpion slowly crawling towards that haji, you are allowed to kill the scorpion. Don't say, bite Because <laughs> I don't like what she told me earlier, so no can a scorpion for a bite. No. We always look out for each other. Care for each other. 
If you care for each other and you look out for each other, Allah will take care of you. So always be care, caring towards others. So, yes, the mosquitoes are there. You can use something that repels the mosquitoes. But once the light starts coming out, you see the mosquitoes, they dwindle off and they disappear somewhere. So it's not there the whole day. So now when you come to Arafah, it's not the time of Wukuf yet. Not the time of Wukuf yet. Wukuf only starts around about 12 o'clock after uh, Zawal time. That is the hour of Wukuf. And to picture, to give you the picture of how holy and sacred Arafah is on that day. If you go to Arafah now, and you stand there the whole day and the whole night, you will not become a haji. You will just be a bhaji. <laughs> because the hour of wukuf is not in yet. You must be on Arafah, the time of wukuf, when it starts till Maghrib time or whatever. That is the hour of wukuf, or the standing on the plains of Arafah. Now, let me just make a slight example to give you some idea of the greatness of Arafah. Every country has a capital city, isn't it? Are you with me? You know capital city? What is the capital city of South Africa? Not Durban. <laughs> Pretoria. Pretoria. Already men to the school. Ya Allah, we tired. The capital city of South Africa is Pretoria. The capital city of America, Washington. But every country throughout the world has a capital city. But I want you to picture, on that day, Allah makes Arafah the capital of the whole universe. And when we say the whole universe, we mean all the worlds and the galaxies and the cosmos put together. The vastness of the universe. You know, there's planets and galaxies that are still being discovered today. And Allah says, Wa inna hu lahu musi'un. And we caused the universe since Allah created and brought the universe into existence. The universe is still growing, growing and expanding. More galaxies and planets come into being by the power of Almighty God, Allah. Put all the worlds together, wherever there is a space, wherever there is a galaxy, out of everything, Allah makes Arafah the capital of the entire universe. Because on that day when we stand there on Arafah, Allah, without taking his divine focus away from the rest of his creation, Allah looks to every haji standing there on Arafah with absolute love and absolute forgiveness. And Allah call all the malaika, the angels together and say, Oh my angels, look at my bandas. Look at my servants. Look at the hujaj. Because all day yesterday you were in ihram. You slept in that ihram. You stood up. You washed your face. You don't comb or brush your hair because you're too scared to use the comb and the brush. You just don't look like you normally do. Because we normally when we do, we, first thing we go to the bathroom, brush our teeth, wash ourselves, comb our hair, put on the oils and the lotions, mascaras, lipstick, not us, you. <laughs> mascaras, lipstick, whatever, to give you that fresh look, that presentable look. Now you've been in a haram, you are, not, you are just your naked self your normal self that you are presenting to Allah. Standing there on Arafah, full of dust, creased ihram, face maybe even not washed properly, hair standing, 
you are looking at sight. But to Allah, you look so absolutely beautiful. And Allah boasted the malaik and said, look at my servants. Their hair is disheveled. They are full of dust. They are tired. They are fatigued. Oh my malaika, you are my witness that I forgive each and every haji there. Every haji standing on Arafah is becoming a newborn baby free from all your sins. It's a day of extreme happiness for each and every one throughout the creation of Allah. Only one person is very, very sad and very disappointed. And when Allah said to the malaika, you are my witness, I forgive all of them. That is shaitan. He screams, he pulls his hair, he become berserk, he run from one corner of the earth to the other corner. Because just when he thought he had us, Allah forgive us just like that. Allah forgive you just like that. That's why the Nabi say, those of you go for Hajj and you stand on Arafah and Allah accept your Hajj. Raja kayomin waladat ummuhu. You return to your families and your homes like the day that Allah caused your mother to give birth to you. And that day when we are born, we are absolutely free of sin, we are innocent, we are pure. The Hajj makes you innocent, sinless and pure again. The beauty of Arafah is to come and experience it. There on Arafah, when the hour of Wukuf start coming in, we normally serve people their lunch and they can be fresh, ask them to freshen up. Take the wudu and then we stand together. Now the word salah comes in. Now, unlike on Mina, you performed Fajr in its time, the word in its time, two rakaats, Asr in its time, two rakaats, Maghrib in its time, three rakaats, Isha in its time, two rakaats. Unlike that, on Arafah, now it is the word time, so we stand together. We make the iqama. There also you'll hear the adhan coming from Masjid Namira, a massive masjid on Arafah. Then we stand, we pray dhuwr, two rakats. The moment the imam says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, we all stand up again, iqama is given again, we make another two rakats, the salah of asr. So we make qasr, and we make jam. Qasr means to shorten, and jam means to make together. So we make dhuwr first, give salam, immediately we make iqama, we make asr salah, two rak'ats, we give salam, and immediately labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, labbaik ala, now you are in the holiest hour of the entire year. There is no greater day than the day of Arafah. Arafah means we commemorate that day when Allah brought our parents, Nabi Adam and our mother said, Nahawa, Allah brought them together again. After Allah placed them out of Jannah on this earth, they were looking, looking for each other, crying for each other for years, searching for each other. And Allah guided them, and Allah brought them together on that mighty plains of Arafah, on Jabal Rahmah. There they met and they looked at each other. They recognized each other after that separation. They knew each other. They hugged each other. And together they fell on their knees and they said, Rabbana dhalamna anfusana. وَإِن لَمْ تَخْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ They said, Oh Allah, our Lord, we have truly wronged ourselves. And oh Allah, if you're not going to forgive us and have mercy on us, we will be lost in this world and in the year after. They ask Allah for pardon from the mistake that they have committed. Remember, Nabi Adam and Sayyidina Hawa did not commit a sin. 
When Allah told them in Jannah, they can eat of everything, but they must not come near this particular tree. Shaitan deceived them and said to them, the reason why Allah don't want you to come near that tree is because you're going to become immortal. You will live forever and you will be like the angels. And that is the wish of every human being. We know we're going to die, but we want to live and live and live. Immortality is what we strive for and what we want. So by mistake, they slipped. They erred and committed a mistake not to go near that tree. And then later Allah placed them out of Jannah. So they asked Allah to pardon them for the mistake and not, they did not commit a sin. Please. That is why Christianity believe that God came down in the form of Jesus and he died on the cross for the original sin. They say Adam and Eve committed the sin which they call original sin and every baby that is born is born with that sin. That's why Jesus died on the cross for them. We don't believe that. Every baby is born innocent. And Abi Adam and his wife said, Nahawa did not commit a sin, they committed an error and a mistake, and Allah pardoned them. So, Arafa means to know or to recognize. And because they knew each other and they recognized each other, the place is still known today as Arafa, to recognize or come to know. So when we stand on Arafa, we stand on Arafa in the same spirit of our mother and father, Nabi Adam and Sayyidina Hawa, and plead to Allah for forgiveness and pardon from our sins. We have sinned, not Nabi Adam. We commit sins. Also when the Prophet stood on the plains of Arafa for his one and only Hajj, According to some scholars, there were about 120,000, if not more, hujjaj that year who stood on Arafah in the blessed presence of Nabi Muhammad wasallam, And Allah revealed the last ayah of the Qur'an. We know the first ayah that came down, Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. The last ayah, 23 years later, it took 23 years for the Qur'an to be completed, coming down piece by piece, surah for surah, chapter for chapter, 23 years. So the last ayah of the Qur'an came down when the Prophet stood on Arafah, when Allah said, al yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati Allah say, Today, on Arafah, in the holy hour of Wukuf, in the holy period of Hajj, Allah say, I've perfected the deen for you. What deen? The same deen that was preached by Nabi Adam, Nabi Nuh, Noah, Nabi Musa, Moses, Father Abraham, Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ismail, Ishaq, Jacob, Yaqub, David, Nabi Dawud alayhi salam, Solomon, Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam, John the Baptist, Nabi Yahya alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, Nabi Isa alayhi salam. They all came to preach the same message of La ilaha illallah. So they all preached Islam. Islam is not a new religion. Islam is the same religion which was brought and preached by all the prophets. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, perfected Islam. Through him, Islam was perfected. And it was perfected on that day of Arafah. So Allah said, I perfected for you your deen. وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي And if I completed my favor upon you, what favor? The favor of revelation. The Quran is not the only revelation. Allah sent down the Torah to Nabi Musa. Allah sent down the Zabur or the Psalms to Nabi Dawud alayhi salam. 
wa suhufi Ibrahim wa Musa Allah gave scriptures to Moses and to Abraham and Allah sent the gospel the, the injil to Nabi Isa alayhi salam people distorted the messages and finally Allah revealed the Quran to the Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the Quran contains the truth of all the previous scriptures so Allah said, I completed my favor of revelation to you, O mankind, wa raditu lakumul Islam adina, and I've chosen for you Islam as your deen, Islam as your way of life. Because Islam is not a mere religion, Islam is a way of life. How you go to the toilet, how you go to bed with your wife or with your husband, how you must go and make salah, how you must interact with people. Every facet of our lives is covered in Islam. That's why we say Islam is not just a religion, Islam is a complete way of life. This is Arafah. Arafah, wallahi, I can speak to you on Arafah alone from now till tomorrow morning, really. Because Arafah is that wonderful moment where you can feel Allah. And I always tell my Hujaj, I said, beloved Hujaj, when you stand there on Arafah, ask Allah to open your spiritual heart. Ask Allah to open your spiritual eyes. Ask Allah to open your spiritual ears. Ask Allah to open your whole being that you can receive the presence of Allah. And earlier I told you, Mina and Arafah are in the middle of the desert where there is nothing. Why does Allah bring you to nothing? Allah bring you to nothing because within that nothingness you discover His oneness. Allahu Akbar. You will never feel so near to Allah than what you feel Allah's presence on Arafah. But it depends entirely upon me and you as the individual. Everyone can stand on Arafah. Everyone can stand on Arafah. And there's millions of people standing on Arafah every single day, the day of Uquf. But how many people really feel Allah? And wallahi, wallahi, I take an oath by Allah. If you ask Allah on Arafah, Allah, open my being that I can receive you and that I can feel your presence. Wallahi, you will feel Allah's presence. Something will happen to you. You'll have a kind of experience that no one can give you. You can't buy it anywhere. It is Allah who put it in your heart. It is a time when you stand on Arafah and you just simply become emotional. emotional. It is that time that the angels are putting their wings around you. That is why the tears flow. And the most beautiful sight on Arafah is when husband and wife stand together. Because you have your collective programs on Arafah, but I always encourage Hujaj, please find yourself a spot under a tree or in the shade. Stand out of the sun that the sun don't hit you directly because you can get a sunstroke. Stand out of the sun. Stand in the shade somewhere where you and your wife stand protected. You are all alone. Together you recommit yourself to each other. How many things go wrong in our marriages? How many wrongs husbands do to wife and wives do to husband? This is your ideal opportunity in Allah's presence in the holiest hour of the year, on the holiest place throughout the universe, on that place where Allah forgive you and Allah look at you with His love. What better time for the husband to say to the wife, my wife, I ask your maaf 
for everything that I have done against you. And for the wife to say, my husband, I also ask you, Maaf, and forgive each other and recommit to each other. Just like Allah make you a newborn baby, you can now recommit yourselves to start your marriage anew. Start your relationship anew. How many husbands and wives left? And either the husband came back alone or the wife came back alone. Allah took their partner away in the meanwhile. How many husbands are there? Their wife passed away already, crying, missing his wife. Wives crying for their husbands who probably passed away. If Allah takes you with your wife or with your husband as a couple, appreciate every moment. Appreciate every moment and bond together again and recommit yourselves together. But that is the time that you speak to Allah. Cry to Allah. And when I say cry to Allah, I mean cry to Allah. Like a baby. Irrespective when I stand on Arafah, irrespective of the millions of people standing with me on Arafah, and I converse with my Allah, I feel like I'm all alone there on Arafah and just speak to Allah. And you don't have to read du'as in Arabic or stand with kitabs. I tell Hujaj, close your kitabs. Close your books. And prat with Allah. Talk to Allah. They are in Arafah. You talk to Allah in English. Talk to Allah in Afrikaans. Talk to Allah in the language of your heart. That is what Allah wants. Your entire journey of Hajj or Umrah, you can do without a word of Arabic. Prat with Allah. Build up that relationship with Allah. That Allah who tells us, Oh my servant, if you come to me and you walk to me, then I run to you. If you take one step to me, I take ten steps to you. It doesn't mean Allah is walking and running like we understand. It means the more you open yourself up to Allah, the more Allah embraces you and covers you in his divine rahmah and mercy. This is Hajj. Do Hajj with your heart. Do Hajj with basic understanding. Do Hajj with your heart, with sincerity, and wallahi, that is the way to a Hajj Makbul and a Hajj Mabarur. That entire day, why do you think we bring Dhuwar, the Prophet taught us to bring Dhuwar and Asr together, two, two rakats, why? Because now I don't have to worry the whole afternoon, I don't have to worry about when is Asr, when is this. No, you are given the freedom, just talk to Allah. Spend your whole time just in conversation with Allah. Ask maaf of your fellow hujaj and give maaf. Make dua for your children. Make dua for your parents. Prat with Allah. Talk to Allah about your parents. How you miss your parents who have probably passed away or laying in the barzakh. Talk to Allah and ask Allah, grant my parents Allah the highest place in Jannah of Firdaus. Talk to Allah there. Even here also you can talk to Allah. But there Allah gave you that special moment. Allah blessed you. Out of the seven billion people walking on earth, Allah has called you to come and stand on Arafah. You want to tell me you're not special? Out of the seven billion people walking on earth, Allah said, Fatima, come. Rukia, come. Khadija, come. Muhammad, come. Allah calls you. Allah bring you to Arafah because Allah wants to have a conversation, a one-on-one -on -one with you. That is Arafah. That is Arafah and that is our Hajj. Al Hajj Arafah. Arafah is Hajj and Hajj is Arafah. If you have not been on Arafah, even if you make a million tawafs and you have not been on Arafah, 
you did not get your Hajj. Can you imagine? Do you now realize how important this Arafah is? So the whole day we spend in ibadah and conversation with Allah. And then Maghrib time comes in. As Maghrib comes in, you'll hear the adhan or siren going off loud and clear. But we're not going to make Maghrib. That is the only time that you delay Maghrib. You're not making Maghrib now in Arafah. You are now leaving Arafah. And you are now going towards Mina again, but you're first going to stop at a place between Arafah and Mina, and that is Muzdalifah. And there's Allah's order in the Quran where Allah says, وَإِذَا عَفَدْتُمْ مِنْ عَرَفَاتٍ فَاذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ عِنْدَ الْمَشْعَرِ الْحَرَامِ Allah say, and when you flow from Arafah, you stop at Mash'ar al-Haram, which is Muzdalifah, and there you remember Allah. Now that remembering of Allah there is you leave Arafah when you get to Muzdalifah, there you pray your Maghrib and Isha'i together. On Muzdalifah, you make Maghrib three rak'ats, make Iqamah again, and make Isha'i two rak'ats. All the time for the days of Hajj, you shorten your, your salah that consists of four rak'ats, become two. Now, this ayah, look at the beauty of this ayah. Our great ulama say, don't doubt whether your Hajj is accepted. Don't ask yourself, I wonder if Allah accepted my Hajj. You stood on Arafah. Believe that Allah has accepted your Hajj. From this ayah where Allah says, وَإِذَا أَفَدْتُمْ مِنْ Arafah," And this means when you flow from Arafah. Now if you understand Arabic, Allah could have said, وَإِذَا ذَهَبْتُمْ مِنْ Arafah," When you depart from Arafah. Or Allah could have said, وَإِذَا تَرَقْتُمْ مِنْ Arafah," When you leave Arafah. But Allah say, وَإِذَا أَفَدْتُمْ When you flow from Arafah. Why does Allah say, when you flow from Arafah? We walk, don't we? We don't flow. Isn't it? People, when we are all together, when we walk from here to Athlon, do we walk or do we flow? We walk. Water flows. And why does Allah use the word afatum? When you flow from Arafah, meaning Allah has forgiven your sins and you are now flowing like pure water. Pure water you are flowing now towards Mustalifa. And believe you me, as you leave Arafah, you look ahead of you, you see an ocean of human beings flowing. You look back, you see an ocean of human beings coming on. You look to your right, you look to your left, it's like an ocean of humanity. Every one of us feel like a drop in the ocean of humanity flowing from Arafah towards Mustalifah. That ayah the ulama say a proof that Allah say when you flow like pure water from Arafah, that ayah is proof that Allah has forgiven your sins and you leave Arafah pure. Now there on Mustalifa, you're going to make Maghrib and Ishai together and then you get some pebbles together and you're going to need pebbles, seven and then 21 and then 21. So 21 and 21 is... Ya Allah. 21 and 21? 42. Plus 7? 49. So basically what you can collect, have a little sake, little bag, the jamarat baggies that you get, and fill that with 49 pebbles. What kind of pebbles? Pea size. You know pea? Edgy, pea-sized stones, 49 of that in your bag, and then you rest. They are on Arafah, they are on Mustalifah, you rest. 
And you know, sitting there on Mustalifa made me realize how insignificant we are. People fight for five-star hotels. Yeah, but you say we're going to go to five-star, this is four-star. We're worrying about the stars of the hotel. When you sit there on Mustalifa, you have all the stars under the sky. All the stars are smiling at you. What do you worry about the stars of the hotel? Allah give you heavenly stars that's flickering as if the stars are smiling at the hujaj. There's no facilities except for a tap here and a tap there and maybe a little stall selling water along the way. There's no facilities. You'll see people take a piece of cardboard and sit there on one place on that cardboard together. It gives you that sense of homeless people who sit and sleep on a little cardboard. Allah cuts you to size. Irrespective of who we think we are. Whether I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I'm the sheikh, I'm mufti saab, I'm this, I'm that. Allah cuts you to size. Allah say first, strip. Strip yourself naked in my presence, Allah say. And go into my holy state of ihram. And go spend time on Mina. Then you go cry your heart out on Arafah. Then you come here to Mustalifa. And here, you're just like a homeless person. You've got nowhere to go. You look around, everyone walking up and down. They were, one sitting here, one standing there, one looking for water. And that is the time also I realized how your du'as can be accepted. I sat there on Mustalifa and I thought, Ya Allah, I am so thirsty. I'm so thirsty. But I know if I stand up now and go look for water and I come back, my cardboard will be gone. Or someone else will have taken my space because my name isn't there. And while I was still thinking of water and saying, Ya Allah, I'm so thirsty, someone came past, gave me some water and disappeared walker. I don't know, the person, how did that person know that I wanted water? And specifically out of all the people, come to me, give me water and disappear. And you realize, wow, I just wished for water and I prayed for water and there Allah sent it. I should have said, Ya Allah, I wish I had a million dollars. Maaki fakira du'as. But this is how Allah takes you from one stage to another stage to another stage to empower you, to strengthen you, for you to open your eyes and for you to realize how Allah's hand of mercy is on the hujaj all the way. All the way, Allah's hand of mercy is upon us. And now the time comes, the people who follow the Hanafi Madhab, they stay there on Mustalifa till the next morning Fajr, make Fajr and then they leave. Many of the people who follow the Shafi Madhab, they leave after midnight. After midnight they leave Mustalifa and they go to Mina. Now, when you come onto Mina, I'll tell you next week, inshallah. <laughs> Keeping you in suspense now. In case you thought I'm going to say everything now, you don't have to come next week. I'll keep it in suspense. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? I've got a note here. A young lady gave me the note. She was in tears. A father passed on yesterday. And a mummy, Faiza Kamar, is always part of my Tuesday morning housewife forum, Auntie Kian Nemolnoa, Auntie Faiza Kamar. Her husband passed away yesterday and she had every, in the week, she had every intention to come and join the class, but now she's in Idda. So I told her, if it's of any comfort, at least you can follow it on YouTube 
or even later when you have the time, you can see it on YouTube. But we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant her husband, Muhammad Yusuf Kamar, the late husband now of Haji Faiza Kamar, Allah grant him Jannah to Firdaus and to all our deceased, inshallah, and Allah grant sabr and contentment in her and her family's hearts. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Any other questions on the lesson? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, you still got. The question is before you say your niyyah for ihram, I must say that you can still apply atar or sin. So the moment you say your niyyah, now you're in ihram. But now the, 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 the smell of that sin will still be there. It doesn't spoil your ihram. Because you put it on before you went into ihram. Okay? Even toothpaste. Some scholars say that when in ihram you can't use toothpaste, you use the miswak. Some say no, you can use toothpaste, but don't use a mighty lot. Just to give you some feeling of comfort. Because it's not nice to walk with a mouth that's not cleansed, or that's not cleaned. Cleaned or cleansed? Cleaned? It's not nice to walk with a mouth and now you come near another person and you speak and then the person faints. <laughs> so yes, you can use toothpaste, but just enough for you to freshen up and to have a feeling of comfort. Okay? Any other questions? Yes, sir? You can even pick up 70 pebbles on Mustalifa if you intend to throw all three days of Tashariq, which is part of our lesson next week, inshallah. That's why I stop there. But shukran for that observation. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Look, you're already shortening your salah, so some scholars say you don't have to make your sunnah salahs because if you make sunnah salahs, you could have rather um, make full salah. But what is important, if people feel they've got the time, they want to make sunnah salah, and especially witter, don't lose your witter. Don't leave out your witter, make your witter also, inshallah. Okay? Any other questions? Yes? If you have bleeding gums, yes, and you feel you need to, to still cleanse your mouth, it is permissible. Don't swallow too much of the blood also down, because bleeding gums is also beyond your control, and rather get rid of that sputum that is coming out, inshallah. And then, of course, um, which is very important, uh, when you're in the state of your haram, the man, you've got nothing on underneath your ihram. But sometimes you maybe find a person that suffers from a kind of illness where they have dripping urine or maybe some substance that flow out from your private organ. So what such a person can do before Salah comes in and everything, and you feel there's a need, you can go to the bathroom, you make your istinja, and then you can wrap a bandage over, and if you feel the bandage is not secure enough, then you can maybe put on a trunky or something that just to give it firmness, that whatever comes out does not spill on your clothing. So in that case, for that, such a person is allowed to wear maybe just that in order to protect himself. Okay? And the same applies for a woman also. Um, of course, if she, sometimes they suffer from continuous istihada, which means discharge or dripping urine, make sure that before salah you cleanse yourself, make your istinja, put a pad or bandage or something, and then secure yourself that whatever then comes out will not spill on your clothing, inshallah. Are you with me? Shukran. Any other questions before we close down?
Yes? If you get your khayt on the first day of Hajj, when everyone goes in ihram, and here the woman finds that she gets a khayt, she can still make a ghusl or take a bath, and she can still put on her ihram clothing, and she can make a niyyah for ihram also. So even though the woman is in a state of khayt, she can go into the state of ihram, she can make dhikr, she can make tasbih, she can make dua, but she can't make salah. She can't read Quran. She can't make tawaf of the Kaaba. So you can still be in the state of ihram. You can go to Mina, spend the whole day on Mina in tasbih without making salah. You can spend the whole day in Arafah, even if you have your khayt, you can spend the whole day on Arafah in conversation with Allah. Dua and talk to Allah, but you can't read Quran and you can't make salah. And finally, when you have to go make your tawaf, I will explain that part next week, inshallah. Are you with me? That's only for the ladies who get the khayt, eh? Any other questions? Yes, that is a question that always comes up. The lady probably sometimes before the day of Hajj come in, she's concerned whether she can control her khayd and she can maybe go on some medication. I usually never give a fatwa to such a woman, but I rather prefer to tell that particular lady to consult with a gynae or with her personal doctor. Right? Because sometimes something might be permissible, but it's not advisable for you. And it is a known factor that if you mess with a natural course, take medication just to keep your head away, it can have some other bad results. So, like for instance, sugar. If you take sugar, sugar is halal, but is it good? You see? So rather in that case, speak to your gynae or speak to your personal doctor who advise you know your condition because some people can maybe take the medication and it won't affect them and some it will affect. So don't just come to the imam where you have a medical question because the imam might say, yes, you can take that tablet and tomorrow you'll find your growing beard. Okay? So there are certain questions that the imam can answer and there are certain questions which medical professionals rather, they are best to answer that for you. Any other last question before we close down? So alhamdulillah, I love these questions. And believe you me, there is no such thing as a stupid question. With every question, all of us learn. Because someone else might have had that same question in mind and hear the, hear the question and the answer so they benefit. And if ever a person asks me a question, I will not sung, suck an answer from my thumb. I will be man enough to say, wow, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. But now it gives me the opportunity to go and make research because none of us knows everything. So I will go and make my research, come back with the answer, and there I have taught and I have also learned. So it's a one, two-way street, inshallah. So shukran and thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, that's what I said last week also. Uh, if they ask you to implement COVID protocols, because COVID-19 is not really gone. We have become very relaxed, and may Allah keep us all safe and good. Amen. Some are not in favor of the protocols. It's their daba. It's their understanding. I'm not going to fight with anyone. But if you're in a foreign country, and they tell you to observe wearing the mask because of protocols, Please don't fight and argue with people. 
you are allowed even in the haram to wear the mask because it is for your safety and for medical reasons. Allah alam and Allah knows best. So inshallah in conclusion I just want to remind you that Mr. Mullaji who asked the last question is also the person who is selling that tawaf socks which is very good to wear um, when you make your tawaf in the harams uh, he will be outside after Asr Salah inshallah or after the class with the socks he's also selling it in Claremont at the square so whoever is interested in the tawaf socks you can liaise and ta deal with him directly inshallah may Allah guide us all Amen and before we sign off let me once again you know whenever a Muslim make any niya you know what happens if you intend to do something good, immediately the malaika writes it down. Immediately. So I'm going to see now who's all got a good near. We will amal samkhat for hajj. One, two, three, four, five, six. Amal mashallah. May Allah accept. May Allah call all of us. May Allah open the doors of ease for everyone because only Allah who can take us on this beautiful journey of Hajj and Umrah. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Next week, Saturday, same time, our third and last lesson on the five days of Hajj, inshallah. No one will care for you like your parents will care for you. At Annur Education Center, we give orphans a loving home, clothing, food, and education. Be the orphan's parent by sponsoring an orphan for 18,000 Rand or 1,500 Rand per month. A Noor Education Center, a place where orphans call home. Imagine, imagine a world where each person has access to their basic rights. A world where everyone is equal. Imagine a world where each person will have an equal share in each single seed of wheat. Where each child has the freedom to learn. This Ramadan, we ask you to feed the fasting in 14 countries around the world with AMA. Provide an iftar box for 100 rand, a hamper for 1,500 rand, or feed a village for 15,000 rand. Donate today at Africa Muslims Agency and imagine the difference you can make. No one will care for you like your parents will care for you. At Annur Education Center, we give orphans a loving home, clothing, food, and education. 